Let's have a word of prayer as we start our Sabbath school this morning. Mighty King, Heavenly Father, Creator God, we praise you. Lord, we have no idea how precious your son's blood truly is. But Lord, as we look around, as we see the things that are taking place, I don't think we have any idea the peril that we're truly in. Open our eyes, Father, that we may do your will. Help us to get this message out in ourselves and in the world. We truly are living on borrowed time. Be with us this Sabbath. May your spirit abide. In Jesus' name, amen. As I said, we truly have no idea the peril we're in. We think we're something. We're not. I want to continue exactly where I left off last week. And you know, folks, it... Uh, is quite interesting the power and there's a song about it in the blood we are so accustomed to death and destruction today we are so accustomed to heathenism mixed in our church you know we use death and pain and torture as entertainment in our society. It is the main basis of entertainment. And as it is a fact that that sentiment or that mindset is also the same one that deals with sex, the two go together. The more death and destruction, the more we idolize music stars, Hollywood stars, um, that peddle this, the more debase our society becomes. And when we consider that when Adam considered a leaf that fell from a tree, or a dead blade of grass, it brought him to tears. Where are we? The Bible says all those who love death hate God. And the devil has done a very good job of making the death of Christ entertainment for the masses. Either And, and let's analyze this. You have the passion. What is that? What is that? What is the passion? Plays that are done. Uh, shows that are put on about Christ's suffering. And it's, oh, it's so good. Uh, Hollywood did a movie called The Passion that was done by one of the most violent men in Hollywood. Uh, his movies are brutal while he did a very good movie called The Patriot, which was very historically accurate, you can't watch it because it's all bloodshed. Okay, I get it. I understand that there was bloodshed. However, this man took and recreated the life and crucifixion of Christ. And where did he get his script from? Two women... I believe, and I may be wrong, it's kind of irrelevant, who claim to have been inspired, and if I'm not, no, they were inspired, claimed to have been. I believe they were nuns, that part I'm not certain about, it's irrelevant, who were inspired on the script and how to do this. And how many Seventh-day Adventists own that movie? Yeah, Cody. I was going to say one thing about that. I've, I saw that movie mm -hmm. um, a long time ago, um, and they, they, they put Mary up in a position in that movie where she is, it, it implies that she's divine, mm -hmm. that she's equal with him, and that she's suffering right alongside him 
feeling all the mm -hmm. same things that mm -hmm. he's feeling as in a divine deity fashion. Mm -hmm. And I have no doubts at all that that script was inspired, but by what spirit? Yes. Yeah, but what religion is Mel Gibson? Does anybody know? He's a practicing, yes. Let's not forget he also had a Seventh-day Adventist movie, the Desmond Doss movie, Hacksaw Ridge. That's right. He just did that, did he not? Yeah. I didn't see that, and I won't. Uh, however, uh, he is a practicing Roman Catholic. Uh, point being, they glorified the death of Christ. There are other movies out there which implicate Christ or incent that he was having an affair with Mary Magdalene. Seventh-day Adventists see these movies. What does it say in the book of Revelation about changing anything in the Bible? What does it say? Anybody who changes anything, takes away or adds unto, the plague shall be added unto them, and eternal life shall be taken from them. Now, I've heard, oh, well, that's just the book of Revelation. Okay, this is what I say to that argument. What is the book of Revelation? What is new in the book of Revelation that's not in the rest of the Bible? Virtually nothing. It is the summary of what? The entire Old Testament, the life of Christ, and the plan of redemption. So when John was in, wrote that, what was he referring to? Just that part of Revelation? No, the entire scripture. So why am I going here? Because we ended up in Hebrews 7 last week, and I want to proceed from there, because Peter talks about cunningly devised fables, which preachers are very good at doing. They're the best storytellers on the planet. And unfortunately, they're very charismatic. And as Cody pointed out before, and I do know this for a fact, Cody, the women that wrote the script for the Passion claim to have been inspired by, who do you think? Well, either Mary or the Holy Spirit. Take your pick. And as we saw at the cross, Mary was very confused. She had no idea what was going on. But she was there because her son was dying. Not to give him grace. Not to give him comfort. He comforted her. So, and also pointed the church in the right direction. Your destiny lies with the prophets. Your destiny lies with the, which is a way of saying, and, and Mrs. White says, the writings of these people are not inspired by the Holy Spirit. What is, where does the inspiration go? To the person is inspired. And then the person writes. See, so there's a big difference. They are mixing, God is mixing these people's personal experiences with the enlightenment of what? The truth as it shines from the Holy Spirit. Let's continue here in Hebrews 7, uh, verse 25, which, I, as I had said before, to me is the absolute most wonderful promise in the Bible. In my mind, folks. Wherefore, he, being Jesus, of course, uh, in verse 24, something else is pointed out here that, that Paul uh, points out, and I find it interesting that Paul recorded it this way. It says in verse 24, but this man, because he continues, it continue with ever or forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Why did Paul not say this God, this Christ? What did he say this man for? That's interesting. A theologian like Paul, because he was making a point. Jesus was a man. Jesus was here. Jesus died as a man. Though he were God, he were man. In other words, in a nutshell, Paul is saying he's able to deal with our situation because nobody went through what he did here. You see? And he lives forever. To make in, what is the purpose of this priesthood? Wherefore, verse 25, he is able also to save them to the uttermost. That's a powerful word. Completely, absolutely, without a doubt, that come unto God by him 
seeing he ever lives to make intercession for them forever. That's an infinite term right there, by the way. That's not a finite term. Now you'll notice something in these two verses. Because where is Jesus right now? He's in heaven. And Paul points that out in the next chapter. He's in heaven. He says because men can't pollute his ministry because it's not here on earth, it's in heaven. So where we have man and forever, what kind of a promise is that? What forever is Paul talking about here? Eternity. Not here. We have man in verse 24 making intercession for man where? In heaven. Not here. Because he lives forever to do this. Does the Pope live forever? How many have there been? We don't even know. Because back before there was even Rome, you know there were popes. Back before there was a Roman Catholic Church, there were popes. You know that, right? When you look before there was an Italy, there were popes. You see. So we don't, and there was war, there was all kinds of treachery. There are some famous bloodthirsty popes that go back to the year 1000, and so they were ruthless, brutal, celebrated as wonderful men. So we don't even really know, but this priest, Paul says, and is Mary dead or alive? Now, they want to tell us she's in heaven. I have no evidence of that. Quite to the contrary, actually. The Holy Spirit says, no, she's not. But men say she is. She doesn't. Biblically, you can't take this Bible, and it is such a major doctrine. It is a focal, central point of Roman Catholic, or let me put it this way, of Christian doctrine in the world. It's not even just Roman Catholic anymore. It is a central point, but there is not one passage in Bible that even infers that Mary is in heaven. Doesn't even get, but it says Jesus is. It says Jesus is a high priest that lives forever. It says Jesus is there making intercession to the uttermost for me. Not Mary, not the Pope, not your local preacher, Seventh-day Adventist or otherwise. Not William Miller etc., etc. Not Ellen White, but there are three. And it says, Paul is, and it's amazing in these two verses how concise he is. It says, but this man, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. What is his priesthood? What is unchangeable? This is his priesthood. Remember, we have to have charity. This is charity. Unchangeable. Well, he explains what his unchangeable priesthood is. He says, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever lives to make intercession for them as long as we need intercession. You see, forever, as long, the ever ends when we no longer need intercession. Then he becomes the Lord of Sabaoth. Yes, Cody. I find it interesting in that passage there, it says, he can save them to the uttermost or fully and completely. Mm -hmm. When they come to God, mm -hmm. to, so in, any, in other words, to the Father, by him. Isn't that amazing? Not by Mary, mm -hmm. not by Krishna mm -hmm. or any other, Nope. your personal pastor, preacher, what, I mean, you, you fill that slot with whoever you want. It's no one comes unto the Father except by Jesus Christ. That's a, a reflection of that passage is right here in Hebrews. So let me show you why I think Paul or the Holy Spirit working in Paul's mind, Paul wrote the word man in there. Now that may be added to the text as it's in italics. However, the intent is there. If, in fact, Jesus said to his apostles, to us, well, let's back up. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Who was he talking to? God. Who was he talking to? The Holy Spirit was there. The three were there, correct? 
Where was the Holy Spirit? How do we know the Holy Spirit was at Christ's baptism? I'm not going to go back and read it because this is a well-known story by every professed Christian on the earth. This is a well-known story. How do we know that the Holy Spirit was present? Is it recorded in the scripture that it says the Holy Spirit descended how? As a dove, which is very significant in the fact that, was there such thing called a dove offering? Sacrifice? Either way, and also, what does a dove represent? Peace. So, just as in the book of Genesis, let us make man in our own image, that was exactly the same statement. Only after 4,000 years of what? Violent sin, would you say, Samuel? Heinous sin. Actual, a creation working to destroy the creator. So really, you had almost the exact same scene, only the complete opposite. And when I think, of, when Mrs. White says type met anti-type, I think of the baptism, and I think of from heaven. And did everybody hear what God had to say? Or did just some understand the words? It was a very, very well-known event that took place. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Did that only have re refer to the man that was just baptized? Or to anybody who accepted that? Anybody who accepted that? So when Paul says here, and I'll bet you Paul was there. Saul was there. I'm saying, in my, and I don't know if Mrs. White refers to it. It really doesn't matter. In my mind, because wasn't Saul one of the watchdogs? Wasn't he one of their attack dogs? I'm not calling him a dog, but he was one of their operatives. I'll put it that way, in high rank. Okay. It says man, Paul says, he was there. Well, in my opinion. So then, I think he wrote it that way because after Paul got knocked off his horse, and crippled or disabled on the road to Emmaus, or his eyes, that was Jacob the hip. Uh, what was his mission at that point? After that, what was his mission? To save to the uttermost all those whom he can forever. That's why he wrote that. What should our work be? To point people to the Holy Spirit to point people to Jesus Christ. And you'll notice, as Cody clearly pointed out, it doesn't say any other agency, Seventh-day Adventists. And also, this becomes extremely personal. There is no organization in between here. Do you read that? Do you see that? Was Paul intending that when he wrote that? To say, well, you have to come to this organization. When he was Saul, he would have said that. Oh no, you've got you've to come before the Sanhedrin and be accepted. If you don't believe that statement, I want you to never forget the blind man and what the parents said to the Sanhedrin. Oh, we don't want to get kicked out. He's got to speak for himself. Who did they think salvation came from? Cody? Just, just by the example of the baptism, it would, it would appear that the Holy Spirit, God, and Jesus Christ were all actually anti-organization because mm, they think? went to a self-supporting ministry in John the Baptist, them themselves having a self-supporting ministry outside of the... T they didn't go straight to the Pharisees and nope. the Sanhedrin for this. Yep. And they should have if that was the point that was trying to be made that you need to go through the organizational channels. Cody? But they didn't. From Christ's birth, this was an issue. Remember we read in 2 Timothy, claiming having a form of godliness and, de and, 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 and denying the power thereof? That's written to us. That's not written to the world. They don't have any form of godliness. They don't want one. That's written to us. And who creeps into the churches and steals people away? Who? These people these preachers, these men. So here, if Christ is our example in all things, we cannot be the intercessor. However, we can be the conductor. 
What did I mean by that? By our lives, by our testimony, by our teaching, we can conduct people to who? This. They've got to see that first. There's no other way. Otherwise, it's all legalism. Yes, Cody? It's, it's almost like uh, we become co-intercessors with Christ. We, mm -hmm. we act the role. We don't have power, but we intercess on other people's behalf, just like Moses did, just like Nehemiah did. Mm -hmm. That we do that for other people. We pray for them. We, like you said, we, we witness in our, in our lives, in our daily lives, the, the truth of the gospel of Christ and the power that can be found within him. Mm -hmm. And you know who else was a major intercessor on this planet, standing in the, in, in the breach? One of the most unrecognized, but one of the most powerful, was Joseph. What did he do for the world? He was such a powerful witness that his Pharaoh will be where? He will be in heaven. He became a Seventh-day Adventist because of Joseph. Because I got news for you. Joseph dressed like an Egyptian. Did you know that? He wore uh, what he needed to be to be recognized as rank. But folks, before everybody goes ballistic, in those days, jewelry was rank. It was not anything that the masses ever thought they could own. You understand what I'm saying? When they wore a crown, when they wore a necklace, when they had a signet, they were the tools of their office. It was very much different. But when Joseph went out, they knew he was of God, because what went before Joseph? What was Joseph's, Joseph's legacy? What was it? He wasn't alive during the plagues. He was long dead. What was it? He saved the world from what? Famine. Is there an object lesson? It? Seven good years, seven bad years. He was reunited with Israel through that, was he not? His brothers were converted and acknowledged their sin through that. But is there an object lesson there? And Joseph was humble and meek. But yet, as Pharaoh said to him, only by the throne will I be greater than you. He told him, you're ruling Egypt. I've got a lot to learn. Can you imagine how this man humbled himself for an Egyptian king at that time who was seen as God? That pharaoh must have been loathed by the other rulers at that point. Because if you don't believe me, look at what happened with Daniel. So, I see an object lesson in that whole story in one place. Joseph fed the world spiritually. When people had to come to Egypt for food, what story do you think they were talking about on the way? You think that what happened in Joseph interpreting the dreams, in Joseph, how did a, a, a Israelite and the Egyptians loathed farmers? Did you know that? Shepherds, they didn't like them. They were filthy, dirty people that they were to have. That's why they were put in the land of Goshen which was the most fertile land, to separate them so there was no problems. They didn't like them. They were low. However, while they were on their way to Egypt, the question had to be asked among the masses, what would you be telling your wife, Samuel, if you were going to Egypt? What would she ask you? Samuel, why is there food there? There's food nowhere else in the world. What would you tell her? Well, this guy Joseph, you see, Oh, by the way, he was a Hebrew. Well, there weren't any then. He was an Israelite, you see. And he had this vision. Oh, you don't think that the Holy Spirit wasn't bringing this story right before their face. If you don't, again, Jesus got his parents to acknowledge his crucifixion and the plan of redemption by a drastic means, did he not? When he was 12 years old? So... When these people, these nations, were on their way to get food, the story was told that the God of Abraham, Jake, and, and Isaac, because that's how they referred to him, provided the food. So while there was a physical lack 
of nutrition. What was lacking in the world at that time? That God did this? A spiritual lack. And who made that up? Who was their intercessor on earth? Isn't that amazing? It was Joseph. And did Joseph deny people that came into Egypt for food based on where they were from, what language they... No. If you had the money, you could buy it. What is our money? What is our money? What is the Laodiceans money? We're told what our money is. We have, we're poor, blind, and naked. What is the money that we have to pay to Jesus to get his intercession? The gold refined in the fire. What is that gold? Our characters. It's a heavy price. See, we've got to hang on that cross with him. When, when Christians look at, the, oh, oh, Jesus, oh, the passion, oh. It's not about passion. If it was passion, Jesus would have called soldiers out of heaven and mowed them all down. And you know, folks, when they arrested him, it's just like when Noah was getting on the ark. And this happened when they arrested him at the Seventh-day Adventist General Conference. Two major events that Jesus was still trying to get through to these people happened at his arrest. What were they? Divine events. And, I, and I'm going to liken this to the animals getting on the ark. But this was more of a worldwide event with the animals. Peter cut off a dude's ear. What did Jesus do? He touched his ear and healed it. Really? Nobody thought that that was something to fear or admire? What else happened so the disciples could escape? There was glory from heaven flashed. That's right, Samuel. And they all fell as dead men. But they got up bent on their intent even more. You want to give your mind over to the false doctrines? These were Seventh-day Adventists. And they were more bent on killing the man who just did these two things. Men of war were standing there with weapons, and they fell to the ground. So the others could escape. Not Jesus. Now, what were these people thinking when they watched these animals, two by two, seven by seven, orderly walk into that ark? They were still laughing and making fun. How much had the devil infected their minds? How far away from the Holy Spirit were these people drawn? There were Seventh-day Adventists there, so-called. They could go and see the Garden of Eden. They saw the flaming, uh, uh, they, they knew the stories that Adam and Enoch and all down with the, were telling were absolutely true because the evidence was there. Yeah, Cody, you want to say something? I was going to say, um, it just goes to show you, you know, we, we have to make a choice for God and, and completely submit ourselves to his authority and his will. Otherwise, we're not going to have a choice. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna watch the animals go on to the ark and still laugh and joke. And Mrs. White says, just as in the days of the flood, and just, just like it was when... Sodom and Gomorrah. The, yes. Mm -hmm. which, and remember Lot, he went around to his family members and they laughed him to scorn Said he was too. drunk. Yeah. And it, it's amazing. It's, it's, we're not going to have a choice when that time comes, we can't think to ourselves that, oh, well, when we see these things, obviously we'll wake up. <laughs> no, it won't, it'll, be, it'll be too late then. And we'll end up doing stuff that later on when we're resurrected in the second resurrection, we'll be like, I can't believe I saw that happen and I did nothing. Yeah. Well, the amazing thing is for the people who were watching the animals get on the ark, they could have got on too. For the people that watched Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane at his arrest, who saw those two miraculous things, they could have said, no, I want nothing. They did not. They had an opportunity to change, but when they see it now, what's happened? It's done. There is no more opportunity. We don't realize how rapidly, and when we're told this is going to happen, when we're told that probation will close stealthily, nobody will know. Well, folks, as a Seventh-day Adventist, that's double jeopardy. Why did I say that? Because it closes where first? On us. 
what happens out in the world is irrelevant, is it not? So, yes, they were bent, the devil had their mind. And it's amazing to me because if I were there, I would have blown them all up. <laughs> Think about that. Because remember the old statement, by grace, there go I. If not for grace, there go I. However you want to look at it. You see? So when it says to the uttermost, all these emotions, all these passions, and Cody, to answer your question or comment on your comment, in the Garden of Gethsemane, where was the organization and where were the Christians? Was there not a war? Full blown? I imagine it was similar to what went on in heaven at Lucifer's rebellion. On a small, tiny, little cosmic scale. So when Paul, of all people, makes this statement, who was in the business of, well, allegedly saving people, he killed more than he saved, you see, that without man's interference, although he says man, though he were man, he were God, though he were God, he were man, he stands there before the Father saying, Father, I was there. I know what they're going through. That's why he says that. But where to stand in the breach here? Because I just mentioned, we just mentioned a couple of people who were standing in the breach. Not to mention Moses. How many lives did he save? Look at Cora, Dathan, and Abiram. You know, Mrs. White says that that rebellion is taking place again. That rebellion is... Th people want smooth things. People want easy things. Seventh-day Adventists now believe wholeheartedly you can sin and go to heaven. Or Mary's making intercession. It's one and the same. Just a different twist. Did God really mean what he said? Absolutely. Because you see that? This is the problem the devil has. He can't deny that. How could you make the statement, did God really mean what he said, and then he hung his son on a tree to be brutally murdered by fiends connected with Lucifer? Isn't that kind of a stupid statement in light of the evidence? And the world cannot deny this happened. It's impossible. Two things, that every race on earth, every, well, has record of. Do you know what they are? The flood and the crucifixion of Christ. <laughs> you will find back in ancient records, every tribe, every kindred that was out there has record of the flood. You never see them point back to records that they found, do you? Just opinions that the flood was, well, it was a thing, it was a story, it was an allegory, uh, 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 allegoric, uh, 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 metaphoric thing that was being portrayed. If you go and you dig, you will find they have records from just every established nation that was there after who has record of the great flood. Isn't that amazing? I used to have a book that had them all in there. I don't know where it went, but you'll find that to be fact. And this one, every tongue at that time has record of the crucifixion of Christ. So you can't deny they happened. Yes, Cody? It's interesting. It just proves that point again that when, when I believe it was Paul said that the gospel had been preached to every creature under or, on, on earth, that yep. it was true. Because yep. even even I know of like the Iroquois, they had this, this person come, come from the sea and they called him the peacemaker and the lawgiver. And they gave them this, this law, this commandments of, of life and a way of being that brought peace to all their whole region. Yep. So you, you have these stories and they, we don't, an amazing story, and I know Jonathan Gray brings it out a little bit in the Ark of the Covenant book, is if you look at some of these people like Joseph of Arimathea and you try to, you try to archaeologically find where they went, they went everywhere. Yes. All those people went yes. everywhere and brought that gospel with them. Yes, Jim Arabito too, the great trail of the apostles. They encompassed the globe. Places, you know, they want to deny, and it's Rome's work. I'm sure it really angers the Pope that this place is not called Columbus. It's called America. 
But there is unearthed evidence years ago that the Vikings were all over here. They were all over here. They have a whole settlement they found in Nova Scotia that was a Viking settlement. That dates way, 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 way back. They've been trying to suppress it, but so much evidence has come forward now they can't anymore. And that was the sunstones. That's an amazing story of the Viking sunstone. Amazing story how that really worked. Their navigational charts, incredible, because they recreated the whole thing with the crystal and how they used it. Uh, go look it up and watch it. There's, there's a, an archaeologist who went and redid the whole thing using a Viking boat, using the chart they had or the method of, and even in the, fo even in the in overcast, they could navigate. Anywheres on the planet, within mind-blowing accuracy of coming to where they wanted. No, there, there's evidence of all that, Cody. All this went out. But Rome, you see, they didn't like the idea that this place didn't get named after the Pope. <laughs> you see. And I find it interesting because Columbus was connected with the travelers. Did you know that? You know who the travelers became? The Masons. I ask you, at that time, how did an Italian get money from a Spanish government to go explore the world? They hated each other, which, down the road, what did the Spaniards do to Columbus? They killed him. Interesting. So you have a popish connection there, but he went the wrong way. Unbelievable. Let's not get off into that. But it, it, it's amazing that America got named what it is. But then we're, our, we have, we're a chosen nation. We're told that by the Holy Spirit. To do what? To spread this third angel's message. So we see there's a great deal of power in these two verses for us that we are to stand in the breach. What is there between the world and utter and complete destruction on this planet? What is here? What is to stop it? Seventh-day Adventists. That's why we're here. What are we doing? We're participating in what? The world. I'm just saying. There's a reason why we're told we will have to get back to the way the apostles lived. Those that are faithful to Christ will be that way. There's a reason why the devil took the term present truth and twisted it. You know, Peter uses that term. What was his present truth? What would you say, Peter? It's, in, it's there. We're, gonna, we're, we're closing out, actually, this first chapter of Peter 2. And the reason I picked that is because the very reason that Cody just said, you let the organization get in the way, you're done. That's what Peter's explaining. That's what John's explaining. That's what Mark, Matthew, Luke, et cetera, et cetera. Jude, Jude comes down hard. James, Jude comes down very hard on the leadership. Jude is blistering on the leadership. That's all that, that, chap, that, that book is about. But we have been conditioned to apply these warnings not to the leadership of this church. Why did, let me give you an example. Why did, not me, let the Bible give you an example, Adam participate in Eve's downfall? What was the purpose? What was the main motivation of Adam? Now, I want to compare this. And Adam was a type of Christ, correct? They are compared. Well, he was born in perfection, never sinned. Jesus came, was born in sin, not perfection. What I mean, well, they were not a type, they were compared. Adam partook of Eve's sin because he loved her. And if she was lost, then by all means, it was his fate also. Who do you suppose knew that? A charismatic leader? Who would you call the charismatic leader? Satan. How many people are going to perdition because of a leader when they know what they're doing is wrong, but they can't go against their leader. I give you the blind man's parents. I give you Judas. Nazi Germany. 
example after it. So how safe are we? Because only this man can save to the uttermost because he did that. And until we do that, we can't be saved. And if we do that, and you say, oh, you can't go to the cross. Well, why did Jesus say you got to pick up your cross and follow him? Why did Paul say, I die daily, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? We cannot be used of by the Holy Spirit. Why did Jesus say, he who seeks to save his life shall lose it? What life was he talking about? Because the ones that so, so saved their life and their time were the rich and wealthy. Leaders, leaders of the church. Rich and wealthy people are not evil. That's class warfare. Okay? Actually, technically, if you get into it, who gave them their wealth to begin with? Who allowed them to accrue it to begin with? Lucifer cannot do anything unless he's allowed to do it. Okay? Am I saying that they're good? No. I'm just saying we don't look down our nose at anybody other than ourselves. <laughs> you see? But he who loses his life shall gain it. Well, that's losing your life, isn't it? By Jesus losing his life as a man, what did he gain? What did he gain? Every soul that will confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and follow the Lamb wheresoever he goes. Even that verse, follow the Lamb wheresoever. Who wants to follow a Lamb? Who wants to follow a Lamb? What is a Lamb? Led to the slaughter? What is a lamb? It's, it's not a powerful beast. Oh, yes, it is when used in, it is the most powerful beast in the universe when used in that. But a lamb is known for what? Tender, gentle, kind, naive. So we have to follow Christ. What did he say? Unless you become like a what? Little child, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Folks, when Jesus told Nicodemus that you must be born again. And, Jesus, and Nicodemus said, and this was the rub. This is what Nicodemus blew his mind. I think he fully understood the meaning of what Jesus meant in the sense that, because Nicodemus responded, what, can a man enter into his mother's womb and be born again? Oh no, I'm of the right church. You're telling me I gotta join another church? That's what he was saying to him. Or, if you'd like, I have to have different parents? What did Jesus say at 12 years old? What did he say? Did you not know I'd be about my father's? Did he tell Mary and Joseph that he had different parents? A parent? Yes. His father's business. When Jesus said to Nicodemus, May, you must be born again, Nicodemus was stunned, not at the physical aspect of it, at the the he was a theologian at the theological aspect. Nicodemus full well knew that a woman represented a church. He knew that. He also knew Jesus was talking on a spiritual level. So think about that. I mean, if I can figure it out, and I'm no intellectual, Nicodemus was, in the right things he was in it because he ended up in the right place. The mere fact he was talking to Jesus showed that the Holy Spirit was working with Nicodemus. He knew that Jesus was telling him that system you're in is garbage. It's polluted. He knew Jesus was telling him, you have to come out of that system. So what was he saying about the organization to Nicodemus? Because the, the statement that Nicodemus made that back to Jesus was so absurd, it was sarcasm. So where was Nicodemus going? But Jesus caught him off guard. Because Nicodemus, well, we're the chosen people. What are you talking about? Think about it. Think about it. He was telling Nicodemus, oh no. You see that system you're in? Uh-uh. He was basically saying the Holy Spirit's not there. And shortly thereafter, Jesus said, your house is left unto you desolate. Your tabernacle, however you want to see it. Yeah, Cody. It seemed like... Nicodemus definitely had a, a, a major struggle going on, the great oh, yeah. controversy going on. Because that, 
that response almost seems like it, it seems like a, a knee-jerk reaction of it somebody was. who has just been insulted. It was. And that's exactly what it was, yeah. And, and I was. think that's because he, he's coming here to see Jesus in the night, um, nonetheless, but he's still, he's coming to see Jesus. Yes, he was. And he's expecting Jesus to, to think, oh, I'm finally being accepted by one of the leaders in Israel. And it this was. Is a, this is a great um, coalition and partnership we can make here. And for Jesus to say, no, your religion's garbage, that's He's what he like, said. Oh, what? And the first thing to, <laughs> came to his mind. Yeah. <laughs> he totally took him off his feet. And Nicodemus understood that statement because his answer proves it. You think he was a child in mind? You're right. Absolutely. Here, I'm giving you credibility. I'm coming to see this carpenter's son from a, from a garbage city who has resisted all his life. At 12 years old, he mocked our Sanhedrin, that's how they saw it. He has preached against, and I'm coming to, and what did Jesus say? You need to get out of that organization. It's exactly what he told him. And Nicodemus got it. Nicodemus' mind was blown from there on. And Nicodemus, how can this be? What do you think he was talking about? Nicodemus wasn't talking that Jesus was talking about science fiction. How can I, I'm in the right church. I'm doing the right things. I pay my tithe. I dress right. I eat right. I go to church on Sabbath. I'm waiting for Messiah. But dude, Messiah is sitting here and you don't get it. That's why. And what was the problem? What was the issue? The Holy Spirit. What did he say? The Spirit comes like the wind. It blows where it goes. It lists. No man knows where it comes from. No man where it goes. The Holy Spirit was missing out of Nicodemus' church. Did you catch that in that interview? And then, as I had said before, when he said men like the darkness because they don't want people to see their deeds, that blew Nicodemus, because Nicodemus knew they were plotting to kill Jesus. In the open or in the back rooms? <laughs> so Nicodemus had to make a choice right then and there who he was going to follow. It wasn't going to be another chance for him. So praise the Lord that he made the right choice. Was it outwardly apparent from there on? I think that it was. And I say that because the evidence is at Christ's trial, who did they not call? Who else? Joseph, Arimathea, because these men were talking, saying something's wrong. Something's wrong. Saul was having issues. He was a, he was a ranking official. Something's wrong. And we don't know who else. Because Mrs. White says that after the crucifixion and Christ's rep, many came out of the system. But I believe the seeds for that were Nicodemus, Joseph, Paul. You see? They were talking in the back as the leaders, Caiaphas and his ilk, were plotting these other men. How did they know not to call Nicodemus and Joseph? How did they know that? What? What, Samuel? And the proof of that, as Samuel said, because they stood up for Christ, the proof of that is who went in to ask Pilate and became unclean on the Passover for the body? Joseph. He didn't care about their ceremonies anymore, did he? We just murdered God's son. What are we going to do about it? That's what, and mind you, these men were studying, 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 studying. That's how come they had the, the gumption. That's how come they had the... Do you realize the Romans and the Jews, the Jews would have stoned them, the Romans would have run spears through them for what, what they did with Christ's body. Nobody touched them. They were afraid of it. Because remember what Mrs. White says, I love the Holy Spirit because he fills in the gaps. Happened with the Pharisees and the leaders as they were leaving and, 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 the, and, the, and the persecutors of Christ, the sight... They were looking over their shoulders because they felt they were haunted. And I'm paraphrasing. They felt that something was coming after them. What do you think that was? Conviction that you've just totally joined Lucifer's ranks. And the devil's driving that knife in. Yeah, man, I got you. And I think of when Mrs. White writes in early writings about her observing the Holy Spirit is a picture of Lucifer after his fall. And she says, 
The fiendish smile that would come over his face when he made sure of his prey. Well, he was standing on that hill right next to Christ, and that's exactly what he was doing. Make no doubt about it. I wonder if that's the face Mrs. White saw in vision, was that very face that Lucifer made after he killed Christ, got his church in his snare, and I could imagine the elation that must have been on his face. But Hollywood has perfectly duplicated that smile, hasn't it? And marketed it. And all the world loves to see it. When we look at it, what should it do? Not Jesus make us turn away. That make us turn away in fear. So this thing of 1844, present truth, the judgment is irrelevant. Because if Christ is making intercession for me to the uttermost, what have I to fear of the judgment? I have rather to fear that I don't subscribe to this and become like that. Present truth, keeping the Sabbath and the Ten Commandments, which in part and which in whole is not only living it, but doing what? What did Jesus say? How would the gospel be preached? How would it be preached? What did he say at his ascension? For a witness. Do you know that one of the definitions of the Ark of the Covenant, the lid, do you know it's witness? That word is synonymous to the word witness. Isn't that amazing? So we are to live it. And if you can't live it in the environment you're in, what do you have to do? You want to grow mangoes in the worst way. But if you don't have the climate, Samuel, to grow those mangoes, what's going to happen to them? So if you really want to grow those mangoes, you better move to South Florida. <laughs> you see my point? You can't stay where you are, otherwise you become one of Mary's victims. Isn't that amazing? Folks, this is just two tiny little verses. But when you talk about Jesus saving to the uttermost, it's the entire Bible. Because what is the Bible about? There is no healing without spirit. And you know, an event happened in our family this week that I am so frustrated about because Rita had the answer and nobody would listen to her. Nobody would listen to her. There was an untimely death. Rita had the answer, but she's the outcast. That is what hurts. That is all around us. We're here to die. That's what we're here for. As James says, what did he say? You're but a, uh, we're but a mist that appears for a second. That second is to make a choice, and then we die. But is it called death to Christians? What is it called? There's nothing to me more precious than a night's sleep. I mean a real, well, I don't have to get up and go to the bathroom or the dog's not howling or something, but that I lay my head on a pillow and I wake up at 5 o'clock or 4.30 the next morning with no interruptions, I'm like, wow! <laughs> Folks, to Adam, that's what it's going to be. To Eve, that's what it's going to be. To their son, that's what it's going to be. Abel. Yeah, I did forget for a second. <laughs> that's what it's going to be. Well, that's part of age two, isn't it? That's what it's going to be. There was no gap in between. They didn't have to get up to go to the bathroom or let the dog out or whatever. Or why is the sirens wailing? No. There's no gap. One minute they were here experiencing Christ, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. The next minute, they're in the hereafter. Is that not desirable? That's why James says what he says. There is no organization there. I mean, company, franchise, if you will. Because that's what we have now. We have franchises. We don't have churches. They're franchises. If you don't believe me, infringe on one of their names or products, and you will see what will happen. 
and they will invoke that. It is a legal business. What does it say in the book of Revelation? Making merchandise of the souls of men. What did Jesus say when he cleansed the temple? You've turned my house into, into a business. A rotten, corrupt business at that. The mafia, if you will. It wasn't even honest. Because God does not frown on honest business. As a matter of fact, we're told how to conduct our business. So that he can be seen through us in doing business. So business is good, provided it's done according to Jesus Christ. We're out of time, folks. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, your mercies are amazing, incredible. Your Christ, whom you sent, your spirit, whom you yearn to give. May we accept, may we get this work done and go home. This world is nothing but death, destruction, disease, pain. There's nothing good here. Only the knowledge and wisdom of Christ and him crucified. That's all that's good here. But yet, the peace it brings, nothing can hurt us. Nothing. But Jesus will save to the uttermost all those to come to you through him. We praise you for that promise, but help us to live up to it. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.